Uh, now, if you would, after you've all said hi, if you would turn to the person to your right or left, and I would like you to look at them in the eye and say, Go Lions. <laughs> hmm? Big night, big night. Uh, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold up. Um, all right, all right. Uh, so who in here, I have a question, who in here is a road trip person? Who enjoys a road trip, a good road trip? A lot of people, good, good. So when I was uh, younger, when I was, turns out I was 13 years old, I thought I was much younger than that, but when I was 13, my family took the road trip of all road trips. So we lived in, I grew up in Michigan, we lived in Michigan at the time, so we started in this area of Michigan, around the Detroit area. We went down south, we kind of went down, or I'm sorry, we went west, to, then we went down to Chicago, then went down to Texas area, then across, and we landed in um, the Grand Canyon. Well, not in the Grand Canyon. We landed around the Grand Canyon. Um, and my, uh, my oldest sister lived in Arizona then, and so she met us there, and we camped there, and then we, when we left, we kind of went north from there and across the northern states and saw everything, saw everything that this country has to offer, and, and you know, saw cities and mountains and, and countryside and, and everything. Um, but what, what my parents did, because I was or because you know, we were a little bit younger and I'm sure they just wanted to survive this road trip, is uh, they allowed my brother and I to bring our Nintendo 64. Uh, so this was 2002, it turns out. And so we brought our N Nintendo 64, it was in the back of our station wagon, we put it between the two seats, we brought a TV that, you know, the screen is probably this big and the, the TV is like this deep and just kind of like wedged it between the seats. And my dad figured out a way to plug it all in through the cigarette lighter and let us go to town. You know, we didn't have smartphones or iPads or anything like that, and so this was probably their way of just like, we just want to survive this trip without them killing each other. <laughs> and so we played that thing the whole way. And I only, I have memory, and I confirmed this with my brother, because he was a little bit older, we only played one game, and that was wrestling. We played a wrestling game the whole way, and we're just beating up on each other the whole time. And it was great. I, I had a great time, my memories of it were great, but thinking back now as an adult, these are the memories I have of that trip. I remember that when we were driving, we stopped in a McDonald's, and I don't even know if these are accurate memories, this is just my memory of it. <laughs> we stopped in McDonald's in every state because every state had different flavors. So I remember getting a peach shake, and, or different flavors of shakes. Uh, I remember getting a peach shake and a strawberry banana shake. Um, I remember the Grand Canyon. I remember that being awesome and thinking that it was crazy that you could just like walk up right to the edge and fall in. Um, I forgot, so I talked with my mom about this yesterday, I forgot we went to Yellowstone and, and had to sleep in our, in our car because there were bears around and stuff, and apparently that was really cool, which I barely remember. And I remember coming back, we stopped at Mount Rushmore, which, as a 13-year-old, I remember thinking, it's pretty lame. <laughs> pretty lame. You could, where we were looking at is far away, and I remember getting out and just being like, looks like the pictures. <laughs> All right, get back in the car and go. I remember those things, and then I remember hours and hours on end of playing wrestling against my brother. And that's my memory of this trip. And so when I started thinking about this, I was thinking like, man, you know, I was probably like eight or nine when we went, and then I talked with my family, and they're like, no, you were like 13. <laughs> like, oh, I, so I should remember a lot more of this trip than I do. But the thing about it is we were driving, we drove through everything that this country has to offer, cities, mountains, countryside, everything, and I don't remember a single thing that happened out this window all I remember is looking right down here at this screen and trying for hours on end to finally beat my brother one time. That's it. But the funny thing is, looking back, I, I have largely positive uh, memories of that trip. Like, all, everything I remember is fun and good. I remember hanging out with my brother a lot, which was good. But looking back now, as someone who, like, I'd like to travel and I'd love to do something like that, I can't help but wonder, like, did I miss the most important part of that trip? Did I miss the most important part of that trip? Now, you could say the most important part of the trip is spending time with family, which I did, which, whatever. But <laughs> did I miss the, the most important part of just seeing everything that we drove through? And as we dive into this uh, scripture today, as we continue our study through the book of Mark, as, and we're going to look at uh, the story of Jesus calling the 12 apostles, I want us to think through this question as we read this. Now, are we missing the most important part of following Jesus? Are we missing the most important part of following Jesus? Regardless of if you've been a believer for a long time or if you're still trying to figure this whole thing out, are we missing the most important part of following Jesus? And as we read him, call his 12 apostles, I think we can see what that thing is. So if you've got a Bible with you, go ahead and open it up. We're going to be in Mark chapter 3 today, starting in verse 7. Um, if you don't have one, there are these, there are these uh, black scripture journals around in different seats around. 
please grab one, take one. We'll, we'll order more if we need to, but they're really helpful tools we study if we spend the rest of this year in the book of Mark. Uh, but we're starting in Mark chapter 3, verse 7, and what's going on so far, what we saw last week is Jesus performed a couple healing miracles. He healed a man with a withered hand, and then he healed a man that was uh, 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 paralyzed. And in doing so, he taught about the Sabbath, and he taught about fasting. And when we saw that section come to an end, we saw that the Pharisees and the Herodians were plotting against him, plotting to kill him. And so we pick up in the story there, starting in verse 7, and it says this. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea, and Jerusalem and Idumea, and from beyond the Jordan, from around Tyre and Sidon. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him. So this list of cities that we get here, is where people are traveling from, what this does is this shows us how many people are really coming to see Jesus. It's likely that there were tens of thousands of people coming from all over just to see Jesus. And these regions it mentions, it mentions Tyre and Sidon, which are, which are largely Gentile regions, and those are, those are to the north of where he was. It mentions Idumea, which was to the south. It mentions coming from beyond the Jordan, which was to the east. And then to the west was the Mediterranean Sea, so no one was coming from there. But people were coming from every direction possible, coming to Jesus, because they were hearing that he was performing these miracles and that he was actually following through on them. It wasn't uncommon for people to claim that someone could perform miracles or claim that they could themselves, but Jesus was actually following through on it. He was performing miracles, and people were being healed, and word about him was spreading. And people were coming from all over just to get a touch and just to, get, just to experience Jesus' healing power. So we continue reading in verse 9. It says, he told, uh, he told his disciples to have a boat ready for him because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many, so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. See, this is a scene of chaos. This is not just people coming and sitting in a nice service and listening to him. This is people doing anything they can, traveling from anywhere that they can to come and experience Jesus. See, these people were desperate. They were desperate just to, get a, just to experience this person that could heal them. So as we read this, I think it, it brings up an important question for us. And that's, are we desperate for Jesus? Are we desperate for Jesus? Not just do we want him to be part of our lives, but are we desperate for him? Has he become part of our lives as, as something we do on Sundays or something that we just kind of fit in where we can? Or, man, are we willing to do anything and everything to experience him? See, that's what's going on here. People are doing anything possible to get to him, to experience him. And I can't help but wonder, have we, have we, and myself included, have we lost that sense of awe, that sense of wonder when it comes to Jesus? Are we desperate for him? Now, I remember a couple years ago, I uh, went to a, a conference with some pastor friends of mine down in Florida, and one of the speakers there was a guy named Francis Chan. And if you've never heard of him, he's an he's a author and pastor and, and church planter, and he was speaking about prayer at the time. And I remember him talking about what he imagines when he prays. He was talking about when he prays, you know, closes his eyes, and he pictures just falling before this pillar of fire. And he was explaining, and, and Francis Chan is very, he's very animated, very emotional, so he's, he's down on the floor in tears as he's telling us this, talking about when he prays, he's just weeping before Christ, weeping before God, imagining just this awesome pillar of fire before him, and just in awe of everything that God has done and can do, and in awe of his power, and I'm sitting there thinking, that is not how I pray. <laughs> uh, sometimes I lose my train of thought. Sometimes I, sometimes I fall asleep. Like, I do, not, I do not have the same experience as him. And I remember going home from this conference and thinking, you know, trying to justify it. Like, you know, he, what, he's what he's describing, that's not personal. You know, we're, we're supposed to have a personal relationship with Jesus. So uh, I don't know if I agree with him. And just trying to justify the, my, my own actions and things. But the more I thought about it, anytime we see someone come into contact or experience God in Scripture, they're not just chit-chatting with him. They are in fear and in, in, in awe and completely blown away by the magnificence and hugeness of God. And that's what we see people coming here to experience Jesus. Now, admittedly, they're not coming because they necessarily believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're coming to be healed. But they're still willing to do anything and everything that they can to get to Jesus. Are we in awe this much of the presence of God? Are we desperate for him? Or have we lost that sense of wonder? Have we forgotten his power? Do we believe it in our heads, but do our actions say something different? 
See, are we desperate for Jesus? These people were desperate to get to him. We continue reading in verse 11. It says, Whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, You are the Son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. Now, the, the irony in this part is that people are coming from all over to experience Jesus for uh, admittedly selfish reasons. Now, not selfish in a sinful way, but self, like self-serving reasons. They want to be healed, which there's nothing wrong with. But the, the demons, the unclean spirits, are the ones that are acknowledging who Jesus is and acknowledging his position as the Son of God. Now, while doing that, I don't want you to get me wrong, this is not them necessarily, it's not a form of worship, this is not them, you know, worshiping Jesus. What this likely is, is either an admission of authority of their adversary, so acknowledging Jesus is their enemy and, and in, acknowledging that he is in authority over them, or, or something I read that I found pretty interesting is that it's a, that in this day, there, it was kind of a common belief that if you knew the name of a divine being, then, then you could control it. So this could have been the demons crying out Jesus' name as a way to show people that they are more powerful than him, that they could control him because they know his name and his position. Which would make sense why Jesus Jesus silences them. He silences them. He shows that they do not have power over him, that he has power over them. And he silences them because obviously demons or unclean spirits are not the messengers that Jesus would have chosen to bring his name to the people, clearly. And so he, he, he silences them, and, and so we see him healing people, we see people desperate for him, we see him casting out demons and, and silencing them. And what's interesting here is he's silencing them. We see many times in the book of Mark Jesus silencing people or telling, people, telling them not to tell anyone about what happened, don't tell anyone that you were healed, this, this that, and the other. And wh- what we see here is that physical healing was not a main, or was not the primary part of Jesus's, or the primary reason for Jesus' earthly ministry. It was certainly part of it. He healed many people. But the main focus that he had in coming was to call people to the kingdom of God. We see that in the beginning of Mark, in Mark chapter 1. The first words that Mark records of Jesus was him calling people to repent because the kingdom of God is at hand. So he's healing people. He is taking care of their their physical needs. But more importantly, he is calling them to the kingdom of God. This was his priority, and this is why he's constantly withdrawing from people and withdrawing from people that are demanding to be physically healed. So as we continue in the next section, in verse 13, we see Jesus uh, continuing on, and this is where he's calling his 12 apostles. So it says this, starting in verse 13. It says, And he went up to the mountain and called to him those who he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him, and he might, uh, they might, be, he might be with them, and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. So Jesus appointed 12 here. The reason that or him appointing 12 is no accident. I think it's easy in our, day, in our kind of modern time to look at these numbers and think like, not really think anything of it. But it would have been no secret then that him calling 12 was signaling back to the 12 tribes of Israel that had been scattered. So this is Jesus' way of signaling that this is the very beginning, the very early stages of the coming of the kingdom of God where he is reuniting all under him. And I think we can read this passage of the apostles being called. And we can read about what they were commissioned to do, what, the, what their purpose was, and we can miss part of it. We see that Jesus called the twelve. We see that he called them to preach and to cast out demons. But what was the first thing that he called them to do? Verse 14. He appointed the twelve, whom he also named apostles, so that they might, what? Be with him. Before anything else, that, he, that they might be with him. See, Jesus didn't handpick 12 men that were the most suited, that were the most knowledgeable, that already were ready for the task at hand or anything like that. He called 12 so that before they could do anything on his behalf, they could be with him. In fact, if we keep reading in the book of Mark, we see that he doesn't actually send them out to preach and to cast out demons for another, uh, for, and, and to heal for another three chapters. So he calls them just to spend time with him, to live with him, to be with him, to learn from him. See, this is why we have this phrase at Lake Springs, right over on this banner, that before we can do what Jesus did, before we can become like Jesus, we have to what? Be with Jesus. Be with Jesus. Simple as that. See, the reality is, I could get up here and preach anytime they ask me to. Derek could get up here and preach each week. We could go on the community. We could, we could claim to do work in Jesus' name. We could do all these things. 
But if none of that starts with just being with Jesus on a personal, individual level, then do we actually believe what we're saying? If I get up here and I, and, and, and I communicate as best as I can and try and explain the scripture and try and apply it, but my 12.30, my 1 o'clock p.m. looks so much different than my 11 a.m. on a Sunday, then do I actually believe what I'm saying? See, Jesus calls us before to do anything, before we can do anything for Jesus, we have to be with Jesus. That's what he's calling his apostles to do. He's calling them to first be with him before sending them out to do anything for him. See, Jesus, he doesn't use this divine power to magically just like snap his fingers and make them ready to go, which he would have the power to do. But instead, he just calls them to be with him, to live with me, spend time with me, develop a relationship with me, and then send them out. See, this reminds me of my, my testimony, my, my experience coming to Christ. See, I grew up in a Christian household, good, loving Christian parents. They still are. They're wonderful. It was a, it was a good upbringing. Good. Went to a Christian school, went to church, did all the things. And I, at probably six, seven years old, I, I said the sinner's prayer with my parents. And, and I do believe, even to this day, that I, I meant what I said with the knowledge that I had at that age. But being around it so much, it was just... It, it, it was just like, it was just a part of what you did. And I don't mean that as in like, I just lived it so much. It was just kind of one of those things. Just, Jesus was just there. I was a Christian. I believed it. But I didn't really do anything with it. I served at church, did the things we were supposed to do, but that was about it. And I remember getting into my teenage years and just being angry a lot. Being frustrated a lot. Seeing all my friends at church, seeing them happy and thinking, what do they understand that I don't? What, where's the disconnect here? And it kind of all culminated when our youth group took a mission trip down here, actually, from Michigan to North Carolina to do some cleanup from one of the hurricanes. And uh, how, how kind of, if you've never experienced them, how youth group missions trips go is it's you go and do the work during the day, then you have some free time, then at night you have like chapel or worship services. And the last night of the trip is like, that's when they bring it. Like, that's, that's when you get saved, is the last night of the trip. And so, we get to the last night of the trip. And, I, and it was a worship service, people were singing, and I'm looking around, and people are just happy and celebrating, and I'm just angry, and, I can't, and I'm just frustrated. So I grab one of the leaders, I take him outside, and I just start, I just break down, and I just start crying to him and talking to him. I'm like, dude, I don't get it. Like, I believe everything we're saying. I don't disagree with anything here. I've believed it my whole life. Why, what does everyone have that I don't? Like, why am I just so angry all the time and frustrated? Why, what, where's the disconnect here? And I'm just, I, I'm, I'm, as a teenager, I'm just, I'm weeping to him. And I'm just, I'm broken down and trying to get these words out. And after a few minutes of talking, I remember him just being like, Brian, Brian, Brian. I didn't understand a word that you just said. And so I'm like, okay. So I composed myself and, and talked, to, talked through it with him. And he, he, had some advice for me. We just kind of talked and we prayed together and we went back in the end of the uh, worship service. And at the next break, he went up on stage in front of everyone and told them that like he led me to Christ that night and that I got saved. And man, people were so excited. People were giving me hugs. People were giving me high fives, handshakes, telling me welcome to the family. Like it felt so good. People were so excited. And I remember thinking like, oh, okay, I got it now. Now I'm in. Like now something changed. And then I went home, trip ended. Next day, it was back to the way it was. No different, nothing changed. Still frustrated, still angry, still didn't understand why. And it took a while to figure out that I was doing all the things that I thought you were supposed to do, but I was not with Jesus, ever. There was no relationship there. I, I acknowledged with my lips that he was who he was. I believed it. But I spent no time building a relationship there. None at all. And you see, more importantly than any of the things that I thought I was doing that were the right things, more important than going in, on these missions trips or serving at church, I was missing that thing. I was missing that just time spent with Jesus. I completely missed the mark. And that's what we see Jesus calling his apostles to do, to just be with him. And as we continue reading in verse 16, we see a list of who he called. 
as we close out this section. It says, He appointed the twelve, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Bonerges, that is, the sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, the son of Alphaeus, Thaddeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Then he went home, and the crowd gathered again, so that they could not even eat. So as we see this list of who Jesus um, appointed, we see people from all different, with all different personalities, strengths, weaknesses. We even see Judas, who betrayed him. And what do we know about these men? Some of them we know practically nothing. We know that four of them were fishermen. We know one was a tax collector. We, we know one was, was probably a member of a radical political party. None of them were influential. None of them were professional preachers. None of them went to seminary. None of them were anything special. But Jesus called this group to follow him. Now, we can see this. I think we can often see this, the list of the 12. And we can kind of think of them as like, there's just these 12 guys that are just, you know, uh, just kind of these lowly guys that are down on their luck that Jesus pulls them up and together they, you know, everyone's so, they're like the underdogs. Everyone's so excited. They're like the lions. Like, everyone's so excited that they're just, they're just doing it together. But the reality is, we see that he calls a tax collector, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, which Derek talked about. We talked about Levi, which is most likely Matthew. Tax collector. And as we talked about then, a tax, a tax collector is was one of the most hated people around. They were known for ripping people off. They, would, they were known for scamming people. They were known for taking advantage of people. They were known as, the, as ones that had uh, turned their back on their people, decided with the Roman government. But Jesus still calls him. And he calls fishermen. And he calls a zealot. He calls this group of people. And what I think he's doing here is I think Jesus is challenging everybody with the group of men that he chooses. In other words, Jesus isn't calling this list of 12 that anyone would have predicted or anyone would have seen coming, but he's challenging everyone and, and their perception of who Jesus will use with this group that he chooses. So I want us to read this, and as we see this, if you're reading this and you're thinking, Jesus isn't going to choose me. Jesus can't use me. I want you to know this, that you are not too far gone for Jesus. I don't care who you are, you are not too far gone for Jesus. And you might be thinking, man, you don't know what I've done. You don't know where I've been. You don't know what I've thought. You don't know what my home life is like. You don't know anything about me. And you're right, I don't. But Jesus does. He knows all of it. He knows more of it than you do. And he still calls you. He still wants you to be with him. He still wants to have that personal relationship with you. See, Jesus uses the willing more than he uses the skilled, more than he uses the talented, more than he uses the, the perfect. He uses the willing, those that just want to be with him. And we can see here that Jesus doesn't just call one type of person to be with him. He calls people from different backgrounds, different strengths, different weaknesses. He calls people to serve where they are. And so I want us to ask ourselves this question as we're getting ready to wrap up today. It's where is God calling me to serve? Where is God calling me to serve? Where is God calling you to serve? He may be calling you to serve exactly where you are. And I'll be honest, as we've gotten to know a lot of you here at Lake Springs in our time here, I have met people that serve more faithfully than I've ever seen in my life. There are people here that serve so much and serve so willingly and happily and faithfully that it's incredible. But I want, I want you to ask ourselves, I want us to ask ourselves, where is God calling me to serve? And as we... As we are wrapping this up and thinking about God calling us to serve, I want to challenge you that if you are a, a, someone that attends here at Lake Springs, I want to encourage you and I want to challenge you to start serving here at Lake Springs. I see no reason not to just be honest with each other. Um, we, have some of, we have great teams and we have great people that serve, but we have some people that serve a lot and we have some people that could use a break. And so I want to encourage you, whether you've been here for a short time or a long time, to join the team. To join the team. If you look over to this side of the auditorium, there is a yellow banner that says, join the team on it. And what that banner is, is it's got football helmets to celebrate football season, to celebrate the Lions, let's be honest. <laughs> it's got a football helmet, and each helmet in each category represents an actual person that we need to fill that position. So some have more, some have less. 
And on the table in front of it, there are little stickers that are football helmets that have a spot for you to fill in your information. And after service, I encourage you to go over there. Figure out where you want to serve if you're not serving. Where your talents, your desires, where you want lines up with, with what we need. And to fill it out and to smack that sticker on that football helmet. Because the reality is, this, this, the reality is, people don't come and stick and stay at a church just for the preaching. I would say that even if Derek was here. But people come for the people. People come for a place where they can feel comfortable experiencing Christ, where they can feel safe, where they can feel welcomed, where their kids will feel safe. And there's a lot of people that that takes to make happen every week. And so I encourage you to join the team. Now the reality is, putting that sticker up there is not making a long-term commitment. All that's saying is, I'm interested in chatting. We'll follow up with you and we'll see if it works out. We'll see if you're interested once you get the details. But after service, I'll be over there. Some other ministry leaders will be over there. Come and talk with us. Come and join the team because the reality is that it's, the church needs it. The church needs you. Church needs all of us. But it's good for you too. Serving is one of the healthiest things that you can do. It's the, one of the best ways to build community, one of the best ways to build friendships. And I can say that even before we, you know, uh, came on, before I came on staff here at the church, that was really the only thing that's the primary way that we met anyone here and built relationships here was by serving. So I encourage you, come talk to me. Come talk to us after service. Come and join the team. We would love to have you. We would love to do and make this church what it is together. But as we close, I want to make sure we don't miss the most important thing. Serving is extremely important, I believe. I think it's good for the church. I think it's good for the individual. But more important than serving, more important than any work we're going to do for Jesus, is being with him. Being with him. Remember that Jesus called his apostles to first be with him before doing any work for him. So what does that look like to be with Jesus? If you're like me, when I was a little bit younger, I, I heard that, but didn't really understand what that meant. So what that means is that means first acknowledging who Jesus is and our need for him. It then looks like developing an ongoing and engaged relationship with him, spending time with him, talking with him, spending time with him outside of the times where it's, um, where it's deemed necessary, like here at church, but build that ongoing relationship with him. So what I want to do right now is I want to take a moment to pray. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for me. I want to pray for us that we can just grow in our relationship with Jesus, that we can be with him above all else. So if you would bow your heads with me, let's pray. Father, we thank you that you want to be with us. God, that is a privilege that we have done nothing to deserve. That you would say to us, I want to be with you, I want you to be with me, is just something that, man, thank you. God, I pray that we can grow in our desire, in our desperation for you. God, I pray that we don't lose sight of who you are, that we don't forget how important you are, that we don't forget how powerful and how loving you are. God, I pray that above all else, we remember just to be with you because you want to be with us. God, we love you and thank you for that. In your son's name.